Hi, Peter Rossi here to talk to you about customer lifetime value calculations. What's the problem? Well, for many products and services, there isn't just one transaction. That is to say, we don't just sell the product or the service to people, earn a margin, and then they go away as customers and never return. Often we have an initial transaction that is followed on by a series of future transactions uh, involving uh, supplementary parts or aspects of the purchase of the product rather. So a classic example of this would be the Brita filter case where Brita is selling a water purification filter. Um, so they may make something on the initial sale of the, of the filter, but they also have a um, stream of revenues that occur in the future when the filter uh, owner, the, the pitcher owner rather, purchases replacement filters for the, the pitcher. And typically in these uh, situations, um, the person is somewhat locked in to the uh, Brita technology and the margins on the filter, replacement filter portion, the future revenues, those margins might be very large. So in fact, they may be the, the primary source of value to the firm. These kind of revenue models are actually more prevalent in a business to business context than in consumer marketing. The classic examples are in the medical device industry where a firm say like Baxter would sell a blood diagnostics piece of capital equipment to a blood lab or hospital. Um, and they actually may make nothing um, on the initial transaction. They may lease it at a very low cost, or they may actually give it away. So there may actually be a very large uh, negative flow of revenue in the initial period. But they make up for that revenue by what in that industry is called disposable sales, which means that they, they sell things like reagents to undertake the tests, or bottles for the tests, or needles replacement needles for the diagnostic um, piece of machinery and so on. And that these disposable revenues more than compensate for the initial loss in acquisition of the customer or even the initial piece of capital equipment. So the question is, how do you value this stream? Well, um, I've drew, drawn up this in, in, in a general case here on this in this table on the left. Uh, the first column is the period. So this initial period is the first period that I have the uh, this person as a customer, the second, and so forth. These are periods out into the future. In the first period, I expect to earn big R sub 1 net revenue. So this would be revenue minus costs, any variable costs in the first period. So this again, in the Brita case, this would be the revenue earned from um, the sale of replacement uh, filters in, say, the first year of ownership. Now, uh, in the second year of ownership, I might get, I expect to get a big capital R sub two uh, revenues, assuming that that person remained as a customer. So I have to take that into account to compute expected revenue from that customer. It would be the retention probability, which here is written as little r. So that's a number between zero and one, a retention probability times the expected revenue given that they are our customer. Okay. And our customer survives to the third period, or two years out, only if they're retained through both the second and third periods. Uh, so that means R times R, or R squared, times whatever we expect the revenue in the third period, conditional on their being retained as a, as a customer. And in general, you get this formula, um, a little R to the T minus first power times R sub T, for our big R sub T is the revenue in the T period. Okay. Now, obviously, total revenue is the sum of all that, and I have no problem with you taking those revenue terms, those expected revenue terms in each period, and adding them up in Excel or what have you. And for some uh, situations, it's useful to simplify this by saying we expect that we will, it, given that someone has been retained as a customer, we expect we'll get about the same amount of revenue in every period in the future. So for example, in the Brita case, that's quite reasonable. If they remain as customer, we expect them to purchase a certain number of replacement filters per year, and for that to continue at some point in the future until we lose them as a customer, right? Um, and that's given by this total revenue equals big R times one plus little r plus little r squared and so forth. You can maybe some of you recognize this as what's called the geometric series. If little r is not too close to one, like 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, retention probabilities are typically like that, then this sum over a relatively large number of periods is gonna look something like capital R over one minus little r, okay? So that's total revenue. 
what, literally just a naive summation of revenue. Again, remember this is net revenue um, over all periods uh, into the future. Okay, now uh, we've been taught in other courses, and it's certainly true that a dollar received a period in the future is less than worth one worth received today, because typically the notion is that if I receive a dollar today, I would grow it by investing it, and in the next period it would actually be not a dollar, but something more. So another way of looking at that is I need to discount future dollars back to the present. Furthermore, these revenue streams we've been talking about, we've talked about the expected revenue stream, but particularly for our, uh, new products, uh, these revenue streams can be cost uh, risky. That is to say, they're not very certain at all. Um, so we may end up wanting to discount at an interest rate that is what's called the risk-adjusted rate. So that risk-adjusted rate might be considerably above some kind of risk-free rate or even the cost of capital of the firm. So we might consider discounting by a uh, little i here, which is the risk-adjusted interest rate of something like 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and so on, particularly for new products where we're very unsure. So we're basically saying we demand more of new products in some sense in terms of their in, uh, return on investment because they're riskier. Okay, um, And that's the same series of revenue numbers, big R, little r times big R, little r squared times big R, and so on, but discounted by 1 plus i, 1 plus i squared, and in general, 1 plus i cubed, and so on. This summation has this formula, 1 plus i over 1 plus i minus r, all of that times the expected net revenue per period, big R. So that's the present value of that revenue stream. Okay. Um, so customer lifetime value is simply a recognition that we must balance that uh, net present value against the acquisition costs of the customer. So typically we do find that we there is um, a cost of acquiring a customer, typically some kind of promotion or advertising, or in the case of a, uh, in many business to business contexts, it would be a sales force call or series of calls required to uh, convert a blood lab to, to the Baxter technology, to take my earlier example. And those could be very, very substantial acquisition costs. And of course, we hope that um, these acquisition costs are balanced against a much larger present value. Okay, So let's just do an example of that. Let's take, again, another classic example, the razor blade situation. So uh, for example, a company like Gillette, now owned by P&G, um, has developed develops a rather uh, high technology razors, like for example, the Fusion Razor. And uh, what they do is they sell the razor itself or the blade holder uh, to people in the first period and then hope that they will get a revenue flow from the sales of replacement razor blades. And if you know anything about that industry, you'll know that they actually make a huge margin on these blades. So Fusion razor blades, for example, cost more than $3 each, and they're making at least a 50% margin. So in this example, I have customers. If people remain customers with me, they are buying about 12 blades a year, and they we earn a margin of $1.50 per blade. So that's quite a hefty revenue stream. However, of course, we must discount it. For two things, one, the opportunity cost of money and the riskiness of the stream. That's why we set little i here to point 0.1, right? As well as the retention probability. So here I've set retention probability to 60% for illustration purposes. So we don't expect to retain everyone. We're going to lose some people as they switch technologies or what have you, or sign up for shave a, shave a day or shave a week or whatever that website is. So this is the present value discounting factor. Uh, that takes into account both the interest rate and the or the cost of risk adjusted interest rate and the retention probability. And here's my revenue stream per year, which is 12 times 1.5, what I earn on each uh, each blade. And I'm assuming an acquisition cost of ten dollars. I'm assuming furthermore that the razor is sold initially with zero margin. So in other words, I'm essentially giving away the cost. And in this kind of calculation, a customer is worth to, to Gillette slash P&G about $30 because this revenue stream is extremely valuable. So that's, uh, that's uh, customer lifetime value uh, calculations in a nutshell. They're important for any of these kind of products that throw off a stream of revenues. And you can think that um, in, in some cases, that's really the, the dominant revenue model. 
And so we want to do that when we're considering alternative new products and valuing a new product. We're attempting essentially to guess or estimate this customer lifetime value, which really amounts to estimating the future revenue stream um, and appropriately computing the customer lifetime value and comparing that revenue stream, for example, to what I'm earning on existing products. So I hope that's been useful to everyone. Uh, again, the Brita case will be a nice illustration of the, uh, undertaking these calculations.